So I, I don't think there's a whole lot of need to go over the scope and intentions uh, of this event. I think for everyone here today, and we'll be coming throughout the day uh, uh, and tomorrow as well, uh, I, I hope that that is all kind of quite clear uh, in terms of what we're trying to do. But instead, I wanted to go straight into speaking about how we've actually organized the symposium. Uh, so as you know, it's structured around four different panels, uh, four sessions if you want, um, two each day, each one followed by a round table discussion. Um, and I guess as a, as a first, we could see this as a first provisional attempt to curate a discussion around uh, the urban. Um, so in that sense, we've offered the following four themes uh, corresponding to then the four panels that we'll see, so interior, factory, strategy, and becoming. Um, so why these categories? Um, why interior, for example? On the one hand, I think when we speak of interior, uh, we might think of kind of a broadly architectural imaginary. Uh, and, and here I don't just refer to the practice and discourse of architecture, but architecture at large as, as sort of experiences and relationships that manifest in a species that is inevitably and increasingly uh, interiorized in some kind of constructed environment. Um, human life, I think, in, in many urbanized parts of the world uh, is one experience primarily indoors. Um, so interior, I think, in this sense, may have a certain genealogical relation to domesticity. So we might recall, for example, the speculative philosophy of Walter Benjamin, uh, looking at the emergence of the bourgeois domestic interior, the domestic space, as a kind of fundamental component of a broader uh, modern urban order unfolding. Uh, so how can we look at the visibility of this space in the early 19th century as a kind of a diagram uh, for restructuring urban space itself? Uh, in other words, how does interior as a modern domestic category become useful for uh, reorganizing the spaces, functions, social relations, and uh, the infrastructures of the city up to the present. How is interior also both an architectural term and a kind of metaphor that immediately slips away from its architectural root and becomes something generalizable? Um, and I think here is where we can also look at a, a different notion uh, of, of interior. Uh, when we look at discourses that are formed around the urban, for example, Almost every address of the very problematic forms of urbanization that are unleashing uh, themselves across the planet today tend to presume their solution comes in an equally endless array of urbanisms. Uh, so these kind of rational uh, scientific means by which we then can assert control over a process that seems oddly external to human control. Uh, the urban, it seems, is rooted in the human condition and thus its processes of self-expansion are, like the seasons, natural. Uh, and if this is so, I think urbanization is merely a process that ontologically, like certain romantic depictions of the human condition, knows no boundaries. If we take such thinking then to its logical conclusion, we might see urbanization as a process, in other words, of the perpetual construction of a single spatiality, uh, an interior whose exterior is not so much the opposite of whatever constitutes it, but rather the spaces that simply have not yet been interiorized. In the site, the urban, we might say, is a kind of imperial order uh, whose space, much like the Roman Empire, uh, uh, conceptually encompassed the entire world. And I think such thinking like this uh, led Henri Lefebvre to famously hypothesize that society has been completely urbanized. Uh, the force of the statement, of course, implies that at least virtually, as he would describe it, the entire world is an urban space. So we may think that in this case, the urban, unlike many other spatial categories, is in a sense also scaleless. Uh, and we can increasingly see evidence of this uh, as soon as we try to pin down the urban or processes of urbanization uh, in any one particular scale. So from the interior, for example, we might look at uh, the body then as a site and, a, and a, also a metric of urbanization. Uh, we might look at whole regions or territories uh, suddenly as, as planned or, or designed spaces. Uh, and even we can begin to talk about the, earth, the, the planet itself. And, and I think it's odd how uh, the category of interior seems to suddenly pop up, uh, less so in, in these kind of in intermediary scales, uh, as it does more when we utter the word planetary. Uh, so amidst, of course, growing collective ecological consciousness, 
uh, the world today, or even uh, the blue marble when it first appeared decades ago, is itself a kind of absolute interior, some kind of a precious and uh, delicately enclosed object drifting around in an infinitely lifeless universe. Uh, but in a world which, which seems at once purely interior to itself, uh, it may, on closer inspection, appear as whole cartographies of shifting, expanding, and collapsing interiors and exteriors, divisions that cut across all scales. So in that sense, what constitutes an exterior in a spatial ontology that appears to assume them, or that may appear to assume them? How do we define what stands outside of the urban, if anything does at all? Uh, where and how are exteriors produced in this peculiar space? In other words, if we understand urbanization as a constant uh, production of interiors, this process may only be possible by relying on the simultaneous production and circulation of exteriors, so spaces, materials, and energies at once outside the urban while also permanently available to it as resources. Exteriors, in a sense, are not so much the outside of an interior, uh, but rather, the two denote different states within a turbulent process of deterritorialization and reterritorialization built into the urban itself. So I think from here, a kind of an extension of this discussion may open another possible way in which we can engage the urban as a factory. The urban, in other words, as a kind of technology of production, reproduction, circulation, and consumption. So in a sense, moving from Lefebvre, we might recall Mario Tronti who uh, made a similar argument, in, in a sense, uh, about capitalism in his 1962 uh, essay, Factory and Society, published in Quaderni Rossi. Uh, Tronti wrote that, quote, at the highest point of capitalist development, social production becomes a moment in a process of production, which means that all of society lives within the factory, and the factory extends its domin dominion over the whole of society. <coughs> So blurring uh, the state, society, and advanced capitalism into an increasingly organic social relation, Tronti's suggestion then resonates with Lefebvre's hypothesis. In other words, if society has been completely urbanized, as Lefebvre suggests, can we not understand the urban as the factory that Tronti sees uh, extending itself over both the whole of society? Of course, understanding the urban as a machine of production and reproduction is nothing particularly new. Marxian, geograph Marxian geographers like David Harvey and David Smith have built a whole discourse around this reading, which continues to shape contemporary discourses. And there's, a, of course, a history to this. Um, uh, as cities throughout Europe uh, exploded around industry, uh, the urban then seemed to respond as uh, to the kind of spatial contradictions of capitalism by superimposing a multi-scalar network of infrastructure on top of a, a, of a city, uh, together with landscapes of domestic architectures, uh, at once bringing into proximity capital and labor, while nevertheless inviting the constant expansion of the system outwards, incorporating broader markets, importing more labor from outside, uh, and subsequently rupturing the so-called spatial coherence. So here, of course, the question of housing is central. When we look to the radical transformations of the European city in the 19th century, at least, and we can name many other places and times, uh, we tend to focus on infrastructure and circulation. Yet housing is, of course, historically a recent category that indeed coincides with the unfolding of industrial capitalism uh, as a way to manage labor. So I think that domesticity, in many ways, um, in many ways it, it shapes and controls forms of life, within the larger system of capitalism needs to be uh, thought in tune with critiques of the urban as factory. So how is housing uh, still today a crucial site in which both capitalist interests and governmental mechanisms coincide? In what ways does housing put in, into place micro boundaries, uh, borders, and thresholds that unevenly distribute access, mobility, and power? Can we think of the domestic realm as a political or economic technology in the broadest sense? How does private property and systems of debt become a part of a larger urban factory, if we want? Uh, 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 and, and what then is the status of terms like labor, production, and consumption? How has domesticity become an exchangeable global resource that circulates like all others? So thinking of, of the urban as a factory, uh, we might also turn return to the notion of exterior 
uh, to seeing them as crucial symbolic categories in the process of capitalist urbanization. So how, for example, in, in the urban are notions like nature, the rural, landscape, the climate, the ocean, and so on, constituted in ways that are at once infinitely external to a kind of urban human interior, while also then permanently available for their translation into a rationalized set of quantities or capital reserves. How does the, the urban as a factory execute what McSmith has called ecological sovereignty, the idea of uh, dividing, quantifying, and enclosing the natural world into endless reserves of anthropocentric categories? Um, in such an infinite uh, perception of the natural world, we might also consider certain processes built into the urban that remain permanently out of sight. How, in other words, can we create a portrait of the urban through what it conceals? What does the urban look like if uh, constituted purely by its invisible processes and products? Looking, for example, at uh, geographies of waste, uh, we, we can see yet again a troubling contradiction around the fundamentally urban perception of the natural world. By tracing waste in its collections, circulation, and disposal, the natural world once again becomes the necessary infinite uh, exterior to the urban, a reserve that can then infinitely absorb waste, or at least it appears to, uh, while also standing as a kind of shrouded infrastructure inseparable from it. What other obscure and distant spaces may constitute the urban? So by examining processes such as these, we must also then confront uh, the various strategies that underpin them, forms of knowledge and political technologies that enact a certain ordering of space in which such processes can uh, occur and controls can be set. So here, uh, under the notion of strategy, uh, capital is, of course, important, but less in the geographies of uh, processes it sets in motion than in the geometries and, and networks that its circulation and production may fix in space. By looking at the logics of space that constitute strategies, our focus on the urban turns towards the ways in which the urban uh, orders space the way certain logical organizations of things, their connections, movements, proximities, and populations become ingrained in space and form. And it's by framing the urban as a strategy that such an analysis will firmly reside in the political. As Carlo Galli puts it, politics cannot but measure itself with space, that the control of space is one of the stakes in the game of power. Uh, this is, in this sense, our understanding of the urban here comes perhaps closest to the figure of territory, or what Stuart Eldon has called a political technology, where the appropriation and control of space coincides with techniques of its measurement, the imposition of juridical structures, technologies of control, and enabling, uh, and enabling political economic networks of production to unfold within. The urban understood as a strategy speaks to an inevitably political space, one in which decisions of political origin uh, register in the lines that divide space and those that connect it. Questions of power may be read into the ways in which the urban orders space uh, itself and in turn distributes population, uh, accessibility, resources, and of course how it cultivates and produces wealth by parceling land uh, and connecting it with infrastructures. More succinctly, the papers in this session will examine how certain state, state agencies often blur the boundaries between urban planning and territorial planning, thus challenging conventional notions of what constitutes the urban. Strategy then, of course, implies control, and here we should expect to see how constructions like cities, regions, territories, and hinterlands operate less as a family of nested and coherent spatial categories than the administrative placeholders within a single telescopic logic of control, a political technology akin to, if not expressive of, again, territory itself. By approaching the urban through strategy, we may find that it is less the instrument of a particular political logic and more the product of it. Uh, in the way the session, uh, in that way, the session will approach the urban paradoxically from without. Uh, as a consequence of other political and economic forces whose effects are manifest in configurations of landscape, agricultural production, colonial geometries, uh, rural hinterlands, and territorial machines. From such a perspective, the urban presents itself in uh, far less familiar ways, perhaps. 
Um, and for the person who actually coined the term urbanization in 1861, uh, he went on to theorize this notion right away as ruralized urbanization, just throwing the mix. Uh, and this is what was printed on the frontispiece of his uh, Teoria General de la Urbanización in 1867. Ruralize the urban, urbanize the rural, fill the earth. So the urban, uh, within this perspective, is a much more machinic space, a space of productive machines within a network of embedded infrastructures. But of course, uh, the urban is not simply a machinic space, and cities have historically been known as highly symbolic spaces, sites in which rituals, uh, symbols, and sacred acts could uh, offer a protected space within the natural world in which politics could be thought and practiced. Uh, there are spaces of events in which meaning, representation, gesture, and language make visible a social politics and a political sociology. Uh, surely this is still the case in urban space today, but in entirely different ways. Uh, indeed, many accounts within urban sociology, anthropology, and geography depict the urban as a kind of stage on which immensely intricate social relations unfold. Here, the urban can become visible less as a physical space and more as a thick and complex social space. Knowing the urban through becoming, as the final uh, category to look at, allows us to interrogate it as a space in which subjectivity is produced as, um, through forms of social, social subjection, uh, made possible in the ways domesticity is constructed and distributed, in the way urban, uh, the urban works as a spatial temporal framework which assists in allowing us to recognize and know ourselves, to know our others, uh, in the way the urban is also a network of institutions in which relations between the individual and the collective uh, form and so on. So how are programs then of urban transformation, perhaps, often thinly veiled socio-spatial techniques for violent politics, a politics set in place to displace bodies, while at the same time proclaiming the, the same strategies as improvement? Uh, here we may think of urban space as a space of sanctioned physical violence and contestation. But also, it's an imaginary space, a space constructed through images, films, media, novels, advertisements, and national historical narratives. Such an understanding is surely a product of modern biopower, perhaps, where, as uh, Foucault would describe, the history of race struggle, as he talked about it, would, by the 19th century in Europe, transform itself into state racism. And we can see how this became a central part of the experience of the city, the modern city of the 19th century, from the bloody struggles in Paris and across Europe uh, to the 20th century colonial struggles in places in North Africa, uh, and of course right up to the present in American cities today. How is the urban, in that sense, a kind of crucial space in which a sort of politics of purity has been able to play itself out with seemingly limitless violence? Uh, while much of the discourse that has come out of urban sociology and anthropology has tended to treat the urban as a background condition, knowable only in its uh, local intricacies and contingencies, there is perhaps much to explore in understanding the urban as a kind of social technology, uh, as a sort of spatial and technological milieu of becoming. And it is the pulsating space in which forms of life emerge, are destroyed, atomize and coalesce, the space in which emotion, affect, and affection circle around one another in a constant process of becoming. Becoming individual, becoming collective, becoming identical, becoming different, becoming institutional, becoming inoperable. It's the space that also allows one to recognize the political. The urban is a site of resistance, where becoming denotes the appearance, transformation, and disappearance of events. The origin of emergency and the coming together of community all of which rely on forms of representation, language, and the production of symbolic meaning. But of course, this is one side, and here we should recognize the urban as becoming uh, also denotes a realm uh, distinguished by uh, uh, the complementary and contradictory roles of what Maritza Lazzarato would call signs and machines. Uh, becoming, in that sense here, might speak to the far more elusive yet all-encompassing human-machine uh, relation so prevalent in urban space today that supersedes symbols, meaning, uh, and linguistic representation. 
the urban as a space of becoming appears suddenly as an automatic media for the association of bodies with what Batari would call their machinic enslavement in the networks of codes and cybernetic technologies of communication that constitute a kind of pre-conscious or pre-individual experience of contemporary urban life. And here, I think, finally, questions of res resistance, struggle, and emancipation become far more complex. What spaces within the urban can be opened up in order to construct a collective political imaginary? <coughs> if the urban is a kind of pure interior, as might be suggested, uh, that contains all of its apparent antitheses, what sites, social organizations, or even institutions may offer uh, constitutive outsides, exteriors in a sense, to this spatial order? So, of course, these are <clears throat> these four themes are only suggestive um, of, of what we might talk about uh, today and tomorrow. And of course, we welcome the moments where their consistency begins to break down or other consistencies come up in unexpected places uh, to be very also equally productive uh, in discussion. Uh, but just to to kind of conclude with a, a, a note on the premise of the symposium, asking the question, what is the urban? Why, why do we ask this question? Uh, what happens in a sense when we examine a category like the urban? Uh, or in other words, why do we want to bring forward uh, to the foreground a category that's so often taken to be a background uh, of the human condition, the sort of trans or even prehistorical continuum that we might assume has existed since the beginning of time? Uh, indeed, these four categories might serve, again, as the beginnings of a larger project uh, to explicate, in, in Peter Sloterdijk's terms, uh, the conditions of our collective background as human dwellings within an increasingly urbanized space. Uh, and for this, I'm, I'm very happy to have Albert Pope with us, um, and I'm very eager to hear his keynote that he'll deliver later today. Uh, Albert's work, as you may know, uh, for quite some time has been invested in bringing exactly this sort of visibility of the urban uh, by looking principally at the post-war uh, American city, uh, in a sense, to the foreground, right? So, and, and his more recent work, I think, has turned towards questions of climate change, uh, ontologies, and so forth, that uh, uh, understanding uh, his work in relation to Peter Sloterdijk's. Um, so I think his contribution will be particularly pertinent. Um, we're also delighted to have uh, Jim Scott here with us. Um, Jim's work has, of course, been incredibly important across many disciplines. Uh, and it's precisely why we wanted to bring him here for this event. Uh, as you know, part of the problem that much of current research into the urban uh, may suffer from is that it tends to approach this category from often narrowly defined forms of knowledge and we're trying to sort of ask questions from outside of any particular norm right now. Um, so um, Jim's warned me uh, several times that he's not an urbanist and I will only reiterate that that's exactly why <laughs> he's here with us today. Um, so, and, and of course, his work is, is uh, so unique and relevant, really because it's so hard to pin down to any one particular discursive form of it. So, as suggested uh, in the title of the symposium, all of these four categories that we're going to look at today and tomorrow uh, can be seen as sort of provisional registers of what Peter Sloterdijk has called a world interior. Uh, and so, this notion of a world interior that we're borrowing. Uh, should really only serve as a kind of an opportunistic source of provocation, uh, rather than any kind of meta theme. Um, that, so something that really we may draw upon uh, here and there, or that may emerge on its own somehow uh, throughout the event, but, but kind of nothing more. But just to say uh, one final few words about, uh, um, about this idea uh, before we open up into the first session. Uh, Slaughterdijk's notion of a world interior comes as a kind of metaphor that punctuates his philosophy of globalization, uh, a sort of historical ontological account of the long history of conquering space uh, that unfolded with the first circumnavigations of the globe. The end result of this process, he argues, is captured in the sort of metaphorical use of Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace of London of 1851 in order to kind of discern the ontological status of life under the spell of contemporary capitalism. As a metaphor, the Crystal Palace for Sloterdijk is, quote, not an agora or a trade fair beneath the open sky, but rather a hothouse that has drawn inwards everything that, once, or that was once on the outside. The bracing climate of an integral inner world of commodity can be formulated in the notion of a planetary palace of consumption. 
So especially uh, the world interior for slaughter dike marks the end result of, of globalization uh, by replacing the real globe with a virtual one, uh, a sort of spaceless universe, we might say, of cybernetic communication and its, and its connectivity. He writes, again, where the dignity of distances is negated, the Earth, along with its local ecstasies, shrinks to an almost nothing until nothing remains of its royal extensions but a worn-out logo. Of course, a world interior like Paxton's hothouse uh, is a space so large as to contain its own atmospheric conditions and whose transparent thresholds to the outside world remains uh, far enough away as to disappear from sight, making the outside a kind of insignificant category altogether. Its totality is, of course, though, a matter of perception. Uh, those standing outside of this metaphorical structure uh, of, of late capitalism would see it in far as a far different object. Uh, the levels of comfort that Slaughterdike talks about it affording on its, in, uh, in its interior depend on increasingly draconian measures of security that separate it from the exterior world, and it stands instead as a kind of technology of global apartheid. So how can we begin to open new questions of the urban that really transcend its status as a purely spatial category? Uh, by placing them in proximity to something like Slaughterdike's world interior. Uh, what might come out of this and all the discussions that we'll be having over the next two days uh, is to really imagine the urban uh, not as a space at all, uh, but rather as a kind of rationality of space. In other words, in our uh, interrogations of the urban, we may well find uh, in its constant breaking of classical uh, dichotomies like city, countryside, culture, nature, or even rural urban, uh, in its infinite scalelessness that it seems to demonstrate, and as it seems to be constituted by categories as disparate as nature, territory, production, and social subjection, and so on and so forth, we may find uh, that what is at stake in asking the question, what is the urban, is not so much the consistency of a type of space, but rather the consistency of a rationality uh, whose history has only recently uh, become visible as such in the way space is now in, uh, indefinitely urbanized. Thank you very much.